Thank you for tuning in. My name is Eric. I am an AmeriCorps member with the Chagrin River Watershed Partners. Today we are joined by Dr. Laura Rakatenitz. Um, I just wanna let you guys know that this session is being recorded. Um, so if you like to go back and view it at a later date, you can. Um, throughout the presentation, you can ask questions using the chat window on the right-hand side. Um, we're just going to give it another minute or two for people to filter in, and then we'll get started. All right, well, it seems like the numbers have kind of leveled out. Um, so again, uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Um, Dr. Laura Rockatenitz, if you would like to uh, take it away, you can. Great. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak today, Eric. I really appreciate being here um, to talk to everyone about some backyard pollinators. Um, I'm going to get started here, and I'm going to shut myself off so that I'm not distracted by looking at myself while I'm talking to you and making funny funny faces. So I'm gonna get started here, turn that off. Um, my uh, presentation today is gonna be about attracting good bugs to your garden and how we can use this concept of integrated pest management um, in our very own backyard. So it's not just uh, something for agriculture, it's something that we can use on a small scale and why that that matters for pollinators. So just briefly, um, I work now for the University of Akron uh, Field Station. I'm the manager there. That's my full-time job. And I um, do all kinds of great stuff there. It's a wonderful place. We do community outreach, K through 12 field trips, and facilitate education of the students from the University of Akron, and also um, research from for students and the faculty out there. So if you haven't been, I please reach out to me. I'd love to give you a tour and show you around. And it's located in the beautiful Bath Nature Preserve down in between Cleveland and Akron. It's just a really great place to go for a winter hike. And I also work part time for the Pollinator Partnership. I've been doing that for about the last two years. I started right before the pandemic started, kind of as a liaison to a few of their key programs. The first one is called Project Wingspan, which is a native seed collection program. And it's really a wonderful way to participate in conservation projects right kind of in your own neighborhoods. So if anybody's interested in learning more about pollinator partnerships, um, Project Wingspan, my email will be at the end of the presentation. Shoot me an email and I'll send you the steps to get certified as a native seed collector. Uh, and we can get you hooked up on a team. It's a really hopeful project. It, it makes me feel great to participate in that project. The other role that I play at Pollinator Partnership is an NRCS liaison. Um, so this is specifically helping people that have um, ag lands or former ag lands get pollinator habitat on their property. So if that sounds like you, again, shoot me an email at my Pollinator Partnership email that I'll show you at the end of the field, uh, at the end of the presentation, and I'll be able to help direct you to your NRCS office um, so that you can start thinking about ways to get a conservation plan for your property that really highlights um, pollinator habitat. So with that, I'm gonna get started, but this, these three little pictures at the top of the screen are um, little snapshots of my home garden. So I have a home garden with over 100 different species of plants, many species of trees and shrubs, just on a little postage, a postage stamp size yard here in Lakewood, Ohio. And I really have been kind of putting in some of these practices that I'm gonna to talk to you about today um, uh, on my own property and having really great results with them. So I, I wanted to share. 
Um, I am not a pollinator biologist or a pollinator expert uh, necessarily. So we do have those people in our region. The Ohio State University has a bee lab run by Denise Ellsworth, who is one of my conservation heroes in our region. She is just fantastic and doing really great work there. And she's been putting together these really excellent trainings and webinar series um, for the general public. So one of them is happening now, it's called Tending Nature, and the ones that have already passed, I think Mary Gardner and Doug Tallamy both have gone, um, are, are recorded. And the, in week one, Mary Gardner, Beneficial Insect Biodiversity, what it is and why it matters, was just about 10 days ago. And so I put a YouTube link in here for you, but you can find it if you type that in um, to Google. She does a much better job telling you about backyard biodiversity of insects because that's her job and her expertise. And so uh, rather than do a repeat of her presentation, which is perfection as it is, I just would rather direct you um, to see her talk. If you wanted to learn more about my backyard garden and how I've turned kind of a concrete filled um, urban landscape into an oasis for pollinators and, and other critters. I did do a talk called Backyard Gardening for Pollinators um, for this organization, and there's the link at the bottom. Again, you can find that or you can email the, uh, me for the links, and I'm happy to send them to you. So um, rather than repeat things that you guys can find in better places elsewhere, I wanted to talk to you about this idea of integrated pest management. So in agriculture, we know that um, integrated pest management can help reduce um, the, uh, you know, we can reduce it by up to 95% using insecticides, um, but still increasing our crop yields. And that's really kind of the crux, right? So if we can increase our economic benefit through using environmental techniques, then that's an attractive policy that's happening there. So that's something that gets people on board, you know, rather than necessarily just using a broad spectrum insecticide, let's try some other techniques that may be a little bit harder to, to get going in the beginning, but then maybe more effective in the end. That certainly is a really great argument. And so that's kind of how I got into this idea of integrated pest management in my studies. I um, went back to, University of Akron to get my PhD in 2008. Feels like a really long time ago now. Uh, and I studied this tiny little weevil the size of a sesame seed for um, seven years, basically. <laughs> so this little cute guy here is um, a native insect and it was being reared in large population numbers to help combat these invasions of Eurasian water milfoil. So this is likely not something that's happening in your own backyard, but it really got me thinking about how do we reduce um, pesticide use? And when I say pesticide, I'm referring to both herbicides and insecticides. So how do we reduce pesticides um, in our landscapes? Because we know that they have um, broader reaching effects than just killing our target plant species. And so that really got me thinking. Um, and I and I really love the idea of IPM, of using integrated pest management to, to think about these large scale problems. So here I am, I'm working for the University of Akron and in this project, I was collecting on one side, um, purple loosestrife beetles uh, to release into the um, patch of purple loosestrife at the University of Akron Field Station in Bath Pond. So Bath Pond is a 10,000, year old glacial pond. We have really high quality button bush um, edges around the pond. And then we have a really pretty heavy infestation of purple loosestrife. So we don't want to go in and um, you know spray herbicides in those areas because button bush are very sensitive to herbicides. And so how could we uh, try to control this plant below nuisance level? with the use of an existing biological control agent. And so we've been doing that here. And I'm gonna, I'll talk a little bit more about purple loosestrife beetles later in the talk, so I don't wanna get lost in this, but I don't do formal research anymore. Now that I've finished my PhD, I get to do the fun parts of science, which are science communication and working with kiddos and getting them interested and excited about science. Um, but we, uh, we still do some sciencey things out there. And so this is one of them that I'm happy that we got to do 
and be a part of through a small grant from NOAA, actually. So uh, that was a really fun project. Okay, why are we using integrated pest management? So first thing is that it's a really good practice. So it works well if we can uh, do, put all the pieces into place to make it kind of run like a well-oiled machine. So we're using different tactics, multiple tactics. We're achieving effective control. We're reducing our risks to the environment because we're using less pesticides. We're having less target effects on other organisms that we didn't mean to target. And eventually this leads to, again, economic stability. And economic stability is a really, really helpful argument in ecological stability. And unfortunately, it has to be that way. So, uh, you know, thinking about how we balance these things is really important. So in conventional um, pest management, it's a very reactive control. So just think about if you have ants coming into your kitchen, you're not thinking necessarily about how to exclude the ants right away. Your first thought is like, how do I kill these ants? How do I get rid of these ants? So we may be instantly using kind of some sort of um, uh, spray or ant killer or poisons or something along those lines because we're reacting to the program in, or to the, to the problem. In IPM, what we're doing is, in integrated pest management, what we're doing is we're trying to stop the ants from ever coming into our house in the first place. So we're doing good research beforehand to figure out where are places that ants might get into our house, and we're doing a lot of prevention um, activities to, to stop them from coming in. And then maybe if they do get in, we figure out where they're coming in, we do an exclusion then, and we trap the rest of them. So this IPM pyramid shows kind of where the base of all of our efforts are going, which is design and sanitation practices. So the first thing we wanna do is really make a, a good plan for how to get rid of pests in our gardens or in our homes. And if we spend a lot of time and effort and energy in that stage, then we are going to reduce our dependence on pesticides uh, later on in the kind of process. So again, we have physical and mechanical controls that we can use and then biological controls, which I've circled because that's kind of my area of expertise and I wanna to talk to you specifically about biological controls that we can encourage in our own backyards. Uh, I love the quote, an ounce of prevention is, is worth a pound of the cure. That's by Benjamin Franklin, right? So if we can spend you know, time on the prevention, we're gonna save ourselves a lot of time and energy in the end. Um, by just doing those preventative measures at first. I also really like this fun little folklore quote, one for the blackbird, one for the crow, one for the cutworm, and one to grow. And this is the idea that our gardens at home don't have to be perfect for them to still be really considered successful. We kind of have a perfectionist viewpoint of our gardens and you know, if we have one tomato with tomato blight, uh, we get stressed out and uh, feel like we are not good farmers in our own backyards, and that's not necessarily true. We can we can have really successful and sustainable backyard gardens and have some of these kinds of issues um, uh, that we're dealing with and lose some of our crop to things like birds or mice or squirrels um, and still get the yield that we need to make it successful for us. And so just changing our perspective on that, I think, is important. So what are some of the problems with pesticides? You know, really they have quite a big effect on pollinators. So here's a little honeybee, and we can see this diagram here that shows that the plant was treated with a bunch of different things. And the honeybee, when it's visiting that plant, is picking up some of those things. And in colonial bees, like honeybees or bumblebees, that stuff goes back to the their home with them and infects the rest of their their kin, right? So they're bringing back, you know, maybe antibiotics into their hive, and then their other sisters or larvae are getting those antibiotics um, on them and associated with them. And so it has a compounding effect. Um, and there's lots of other problems with pesticides, to be honest. Um, they are very um, expensive. They use energy. Um, they are mostly made from petroleum products. So we're using petroleum products to make um, some of our pesticides, which is really, you know, in keeping us dependent on um, on our natural gas products. Um, we can have insects and plants develop resistance to pesticides. And so that means you need more and more of that particular pesticide to be able to control them. 
we're disrupting this natural cycle that I'm going to talk to talk to you about. This natural control cycle of of bio of biological control agents that exist in your own backyard. We could have secondary pest outbreaks. So if you you know we uh, humans are not great about thinking down the line about secondary uh, impacts. And if we have time at the end, I have some bio biological control disaster stories just because they're um, pretty interesting to learn about. Uh, but we can have secondary pest outbreaks because we didn't think about the whole complicated way that life cycles um, interact with each other. So if we kill one pest and we didn't realize that it was eating another pest or keeping another disease in check, then we may have an outbreak in that. And of course, there's human health hazards. And when I went back to school to study the milfoil weevil, this was really important to me because folks were putting pesticides right into lakes and then having signs that said, uh, do, you know, safe for swimming, um, but, you know, do not use to water your livestock. And so I just thought, well, our skin is a large organ and we're, you know, consuming these um products through our skin almost and that just can't be good or like having our dogs swim in ponds that are not safe for livestock like is not great for for our pets and and stuff like that so all of these things are really important to think about when we're talking about why we would want to reduce pesticides especially in our own backyards for pollinator partnership we have a really great program called bee friendly farming and bee friendly farming um, has three levels of certification and the criteria uh, number five is practice integrated pest management, IPM, and reduce or eliminate the use of chemicals. So they've deemed this idea of IPM important enough to, to make it one of the seven criteria for getting bee friendly farming certified. And there's three levels. So if you're interested in this program, again, this is something that please feel free to reach out to me about. Um, there is a one for farmers, so people that are you know selling a crop. That would be Bee Friendly Farming certified, but there's also Bee Friendly Farming Garden. So if you're interested in getting your garden certified as Bee Friendly and having a sign that you can put out in your front yard to show all your neighbors and friends that you are doing your best to um, take care of our pollinators, this is a great little program and please feel free to reach out and I can provide more information. Also, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to drop them in the chat box during the, the talk and we'll make sure we get to them at the end. Okay, so how do pests and disease impact our plants? And you probably know this, but let's just talk about it briefly. So there's indirect damage. So we're still getting a, a product out of our crop. We still have a yield. It might not be as great a yield as we would have if we didn't have this, but our actual product is not necessarily affected. We have direct damage. So this would be like if you've ever gotten, if you're growing corn and you ever have um, an earworm in the corn, just like totally decimating your actual corn cob, well, you can't eat that. It's not, you can't sell it. It's not great um, for, um, for you in terms of your productivity because you have direct damage associated with it. There's vector diseases. So this is ways that insects can give a disease to the plant. So um, just like ticks can give us a bite and give us a disease like Lyme disease, um, insects can transmit diseases to plants. Um, there's also just contamination. So sometimes if you're collecting like a seed crop um, or things like that, you may have, when you look at your crop after the fact, you may have things like little weevils or things like that in your crop um, that got there through, you know, egg laying when it was in a in one particular stage or the other. So these are different ways that our crops and pests or insects can impact our plants. Um, and so the way that we want to manage this is, again, thinking about avoidance as the largest, most time-consuming part of our pyramid. We want to try to avoid having our plants get sick. We want to then exclude anything that can make our plants sick. We want to eradicate things at a stage before they're, they're totally infested. We want to give them some sort of protection. That could be a physical protection, um, like a cage or you know a row crop cover we want to provide them with resistance and i'm going to hopefully talk a little bit about this later about how we can actually increase our plants immune systems um, and then a very last so the tip top of that pyramid the thing that we would want to do the least of is chemical treatments if anything that we can do 
there's tons of other things to do before you get to the idea of doing chemical treatments at the end. And this is our way of reducing our reliance on pesticides in our garden. So the disease triangle, I think this is just really fascinating actually. So you guys are can all read, so you can read the, the quote yourself. But the idea is that you don't get disease in plants if you don't have the host that's susceptible. So a host that isn't strong enough to fight off a pathogen, which is the disease or the insect. And then the environmental conditions are right. And if you remove any one of those things from the pyramid, then, I, then theoretically disease does not happen to your plant. So when all three of those things are working in harmony to the, to the detriment of your plant, you're gonna get disease. And so we wanna focus on those three different pillars there. So techniques for avoidance. So we call these cultural techniques. So how do I set up a community culture in my garden that's gonna help me avoid pests in the first place? And I'm gonna talk about each of these in um, separately a little bit. Soil preparation, sanitation of, of our gardens, crop rotation, the timing, water management, trap crops, which is a really, really neat um, concept from agriculture, and then having a lot of biodiversity. So modern agriculture tends to be very monoculture. So we have, you know, whole fields of corn or soy, and we often forget that our soil organisms are not monocultures. So we have a ton of productivity and life underneath the soil happening there. So we have um, fungi and bacteria and nematodes all kind of working together there. And healthy soil supports healthy ecosystem functions. And those ecosystem functions help give our plants protection from diseases and pests. So if we have healthy soils, we have good water storage, we have carbon capture, we have biological function and diversity, and we increase our productive capacity. And so thinking very first and foremost about how to take care of our gardens, we wanna really think about the soil. Uh, the Dust Bowl we know was kind of a mixture of lots of different factors uh, happening at the same time. There was economic depression. There were very poor agriculture techniques being used at this time. There, were, um, uh, there was a drought. Uh, there was lots of things happening that kind of led to this perfect storm of the Dust Bowl, right? Which was just where tons and tons and tons of um, topsoil was stripped from the landscape by high winds and, you know, put airborne and blown across our whole country. Well, on top of that, I don't know if you know, there were plagues of both grasshoppers and rabbits coming in at the same time. And these um, pests were taking advantage of the fact that there was not much else going on at the time. And so they just had this huge population explosion and they would come in and I saw pictures of um, like grasshoppers eating fence posts just eating every stick of green. So that was a compounding project problem. So the fact that our soils were unhealthy at this time led to this compounding problem of pests coming in and taking advantage of, of that particular scenario. So our healthy soils, if we have good soil bacteria, um, soil um, fungi, uh, mycorrhizal fungi happening down in our soil, those things are giving nutrients and, um, and vitamins and minerals to our plants. And our plants in turn are exuding healthy things for the, the, the soil bacteria and soil um, micro life. So if we kill off um, you know, fungicide, we may have those things move into our soil, you know, if we're using fungicide, that goes in and kills off some of our beneficial soil biology. And then our plants aren't actually getting the food that they need because they're missing those, um, those uh, partnerships with the soil fungi. So really thinking about like how this is all connected. We often don't do this. Um, we don't think about how the top part of our plant is related to the underground part of our plant. But both of these things are really important and our soil health is just extraordinarily important more than we give it credit for in making sure that the top part of our plant has everything that it needs to be able to survive um, some of these natural attacks by, by um, pests. So 
if we have healthy soil, we have healthy plants, and that's less disease, less pests, less water. We want to make sure that we give them all the micronutrients that they need. So we want to test our soil and make sure we don't have any deficiencies. And this carries on to pollinators, actually. So if we have um, really high quality nutrients going into the plant, the pollen is more nutritious for the bees. The nectar is more nu nutritious for the butterflies. So, you know, rather than just setting out buckets of sugar water, we want to make sure that all those micronutrients that, that critters that are feeding on those plants need, that they have them through the interaction with the plant. So ways that you can help with this are doing compost and compost teas to help feed those good microbes. Really, by mulch, I don't necessarily mean um, uh, like hardwood mulch like we think of, but just cover. So covering our soil to prevent bare soil helps retain moisture. Now, of course, we want a few little pockets of uncovered soil in our gardens for um, bees that like to dig into the soil. But for around our plants, if we can cover the soil, that really helps keep that soil alive and healthy and happy. And we also need to keep it adequately watered. So um, uncovered soil and dry soil is not healthy soil. So we wanna make sure that all those things that are living in the soil have the water and the air that they need to survive. So again, our soil food web is a really dynamic and interesting place, lots of cool stuff going on there. And the more that we can give our plants in terms of uh, the, the nutrients that they need, the more ability they have to be healthy. And that includes developing immune responses. So plants have an immune system, and if they have everything that they need to grow and reproduce, um, then they can put those resources into providing immune responses like phytochemicals um, or extra waxy cuticles on their leaves uh, to help prevent insect attacks. So it's really interesting, right? Just, just like us, like we take our vitamin C and our zinc and um, vitamin D to try to boost up our immune system and keep ourselves healthy. And so we definitely wanna be able to do those same things for our plants and we often just don't think of them that way, but boy, you know, we should. We can learn some good health principles from agriculture, um, maximizing continuous living roots, minimizing soil disturbance, which uh, is, you know, lots of folks are doing no-till gardening now, and I am going to talk about this um, in the opposite way in just a minute, so just so that you know that it doesn't mean that you never till or that um, tilling is not always appropriate, but, you know, if you're tilling every year in your garden, you're disrupting that very complex soil food web underneath the ground, and if you can reduce that, then you're gonna have better um, you know, soil health for your plants. Maximizing soil cover, so again, mulching, cover crops, and then maximizing biodiversity. So the next principle of avoidance is sanitation. So if you're bringing in, um, this is particular, this is not necessarily an uh, insect that we would think about. I mean, it's a, it's a invertebrate, but these crazy worms are spreading throughout um, northeastern Ohio and New York, and they're really decimating forests and garden spaces. So these guys will eat the roots right off of your plants. So talk about not facilitating uh, healthy uh, above ground plant parts. These guys eat the roots. So we really, if you're sharing plants with your neighbors, if you're bringing in plants from places that you don't know, making sure that you are kind of cleaning off that soil and the and the roots and making sure that you don't have any of these egg cases from these annual crazy worms coming into your garden. Again, it's an ounce of prevention will save you a big headache down the road. So you can pasteurize your potting soil. Most of the potting soil that you buy at the store is actually pasteurized for exactly this reason. So you don't get insect or um, weed seeds coming into your garden. This idea of solarizing your garden beds, this is not something I would suggest if you have a, a long-term healthy garden bed already going, because again, it kills off all the soil uh, microbes. But this would be something like, for instance, if you wanted to start a pollinator patch in your, in your garden or on your farm, you would want to start with bare ground, and you would want to make sure that you have put in all of your effort on, up front to kill all of the weed seeds off so that those really delicate native seeds um, have a great start in life. So if they're competing with weedy annual grasses or other um, uh, you know, noxious weeds in your pollinator plot, 
it's very less likely that you're going to get a successful pollinator plot, and that's why people get disappointed um, in those things not taking off. But if you really do your due diligence beforehand, make sure that you've killed off over the course of a year almost all of the, the annual weed seeds that you would have in that spot, you're going to have a much better um, start at your garden. And just thinking about how we properly clean and prepare our tools and boots uh, can really help prevent kind of native uh, or invasive spread of, of weeds and pests into your garden. Crop rotation is the next thing that we can do to help avoid things. So again, nutrient um, depletion is going to be something that allows plants not to be as strong as they need to be to avoid disease and pests. So if you're rotating your crop with low, moderate, and high nitrogen feeders, you're making sure that you're maintaining the appropriate amount of nitrogen in the soil for different crops, and that means that they are not searching for a nutrient. And if you can avoid avoid adding, you know, um, uh, petroleum-based fertilizers to your property, again, that's even better. That kind of stuff leads to runoff and usually we don't apply it in correct amounts and things like that. So this is a way to help keep your soil healthy without using those external inputs. Just thinking about when you're planting and when you're harvesting things. So, you know, aphids and cabbage lopers and leaf miners, they're coming out as it's getting warmer. So if you have things that are, are particularly susceptible to those things, you can plant some of your cool tolerant crops early in the spring or late in the fall and still get a yield and not have to deal with those pests in the first place. And doesn't that sound great? I mean, just not having to deal with them is, is wonderful. So we can't do that for everything, but there certainly are some things that we can do that with that just automatically mean we're avoiding it because we have a difference in the timing of the pest and the plant. Again, maintaining appropriate soil moisture is really important for making sure that your plant can spend extra resources on putting together those immune responses um, and, and all of the defenses that it needs. So a healthy plant, a plant that's not searching for water or dealing with stresses like drought are really going to be able to put up a better fight when it comes to things like pests. So you can monitor, you can keep a rain barrel, you can do drip irrigation, you can have some sort of thing laid out for yourself so that it makes it easier for you to remember uh, to you know get things watered. But, you know, I'm terrible at this actually. This is one thing I'm not great at. I'm I don't have a super green thumb, and so often I know plants need water when they're wilted. All right, that's not the best time because your plant now has already had a bit of stress. Um, that caused it to wilt. If you can get to it before then, that's a better plan. This idea of trap crops may not really work in our home garden situation, depends on how big your home garden is, but I love them. I think that it is such a great idea. It's so clever. So uh, there's two different ways of doing them. And um, one is that you plant 25% uh, of your crop area early. So that means that your pests are going to be attracted to this early growing part of the, the, of the crop. And when it gets infested with bugs, you can chop it down, harvest it, um, move it out of your landscape so that your main crop then avoids that onslaught of pests that were attracted to the trap crop in the first place. The other way of doing this is having a different species, but similar maybe. So like this one is showing a squash trap crop planted around a main crop of watermelon. So this just might mean like a cheaper crop, a crop that you don't care as much about, a crop that you're not interested in harvesting. If you plant squash and all of your squash bugs and um, squash vine borers are attracted to your squash, they are sparing your maybe main specialty crop of watermelon that you wanna make sure that you have a really great, um, you know, successful harvest with in the year. And I just think that this is so, clever right you're giving the pests what they want but you're doing it in a way that you can harvest that trap crop and get it out of you get it out of there and make sure you're taking the bugs with it and giving your main crop a really good chance at avoiding a big onslaught of those pests and then thinking about biodiversity just this is really important uh, one you're providing things like pollen um, and uh, nectar for pollinators. So the more pollinators that you attract to your garden, the more likely that you are going to have great pollination of your crop. So this looks like a cucumber or something like that next to 
a bunch of dahlias. And so if things are coming to the dahlias, they're hopefully um, pollinating your cucumbers too and your um, and your other crops that are in there. And so this is really a great way to encourage more pollinators to come. So intermixing flowers and flowering nectar plants with your um, harvesting plants is a great way to ensure that you're getting better pollination and also maybe less pests. So it's harder for a pest to find the plant that they're looking for if they have to search through a bunch of other plants that are not that. So this is not just one whole field of lettuce like this other crop. I mean, just imagine the buffet this lettuce um, field would be for a rabbit coming in there, right? It doesn't have to search around to look for the lettuce. It can just mow right on through, could eat everything in sight. Uh, but if it has to kind of search around for your lettuce, if your lettuce is hidden in amongst the other things, maybe some of that lettuce is spared from the from the um, the jaws of the rabbit. So ways of dealing with those types of pests, um, you know, non non invertebrate pests, you can use a chicken moat around your garden. You can do fences um, for deer, groundhog, squirrels, rabbits, and chipmunks. We know that they're clever, but just kind of keeping them giving them a little bit of a barrier is sometimes helpful. You can use um, scents for things to keep out groundhogs like um, coyote urine or garlic. Diatomaceous earth is, uh, is made from silica from diatom shells. And so it's a white powder that you can sprinkle around the bases of plants. And if slugs try to crawl through that diatomaceous earth, it's like little bits of glass. So death by a thousand cuts. Um, you can wrap your plants with foil and maybe that Nobody likes to chew on foil. So, um, you know, there's lots of ways that you can do this type of, of exclusionary thing without using pesticides. Um, some types of eradication. So how do we get rid of things? Well, you can trap them and move them. You could do these beer baits for slugs if you're having that kind of a big, big problem. I have a, um, a background in permaculture as well. And there's a great saying that you don't have a snail or a slug problem. Uh, you have a lack of ducks problem. So if you have a pond and you can have ducks that love to eat snails and slugs, then maybe you don't need beer traps for your slugs. Um, you know, just keeping up with weed maintenance and using natural weed controls like, you know, homemade vinegar is a can work for a contact um, type kill on plants. It doesn't uh, remove the root, but if you can remove the photosynthetic part of the plant, then at least you're kind of keeping things down. But, you know, I try to really go through and weed my gardens every few times a year to make sure that I'm giving my tomato plants the best chance that they have by removing kind of those outside invaders there. Um, other ways that you can do protection from diseases of pests are row crop covers, bird netting, that type of thing. Um, so biocontrol, and I feel like I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm gonna try to move through this quickly. I promise I did practice and I was only at 45 minutes, but somehow I must be going a little bit slower than I normally do today, uh, which is a miracle in itself since I'm a fast talker. But uh, biocontrol relies on predation, parasitism, herbivory, or other naturally occurring mechanisms to control your pests. And so this allows us to reduce the, again, the amount of pesticides and potentially it could reduce non-target effects. Something to think about with biocontrol is that it doesn't necessarily eliminate your pest, but it knocks it back down to um, not nuisance levels. And that's really the key. So again, that's that idea of like one for the blackbird, one for the, the crow type idea. You know, is if you are maintaining your garden so that pests are not a nuisance, you are doing fine. You are getting enough crop for yourself. You're getting enough crop to share with your neighbors. Um, and you are not using pesticides. So kind of getting rid of that idea of total elimination of pests is really important when we're thinking about biological control. So the type that we often think about most is this classical where we bring in a bug from the region where the pest came from. So this is a non-native um, invertebrate coming into a place where there's a non-native pest. And so this began a long time ago, 1888, with the importation of Vidalia beetles from Australia to kill this cottony cushion scale, which was harming citrus crops in California. So this has to go through a lot of testing with the USDA and other organizations to make sure that there's not gonna be um, non-target effects, that there's not gonna be 
unforeseen circumstances, because I mentioned before, there's been a lot of biological control disasters because again, this ounce of prevention and making sure that we've done all the right testing just wasn't done well enough um, at the beginning. So here's those little purple loosestrife beetles that I collected, and they really are showing great promise. So I talked to a land manager out near Sandusky, and he said uh, because of the purple loosestrife beetles there, he can concentrate on other invasives. He knows that within five years, the potential populations of purple loosestrife are going to crash, and so he doesn't waste um, herbicides or time on that plant anymore. He just knows it's going to go through a, a natural cycle because the beetles um, are going to be able to uh, prevent it from getting a really strong toehold there. That's pretty amazing. I mean, that's a great success. So there's also augmentative um, biocontrol, and this is what I did with the milfoil weevils. We reared them native species in high numbers and released them back into the lake, but we knew that they had pretty specific um, weevils are specialists, so they had pretty specific dietary um, restrictions, and they weren't going to go eat other plants that we weren't um, you know, worried about. You can go buy um, things like ladybugs and praying mantis and lace wings on Amazon, and I would not suggest doing that because these are not necessarily specialists. So praying mantises, everybody thinks of them as the ideal biocontrol and why it's fine to have one or two of them in your garden for sure. Uh, one, most praying mantises that we have around here are non-native themselves, but two, they eat things like monarch butterflies and um, dragonflies. They are not specific to just eating your your plant pests so we don't want to focus on them really so there's all kinds of other biocontrol agents bacteria fungi nematodes protozoa viruses this nolo bait is something that they use for grasshoppers now they in they um, inoculate a wheat crop with um, fungus and the the grasshoppers eat them and get inf infected by the fungus and then they're dead and so there's really cool new technology that people are using to kind of um, focus on uh, how to use biocontrol agents instead of pesticides. And then the one that we hear most about are kind of the carnivores, the ones I've already mentioned, and then herbivores that can help us with biocontrol of our plants, like the milfoil weevil, but there's lots of other um, options like that. In fact, there's one, a moth that was introduced from South America to Australia to control prickly pear cactus. Right? We wouldn't want that here because we, we love our prickly pear cactus here in Ohio. It's our only native Ohio cactus. And so we wouldn't want that here, but you know, there it's an important um, crop in their rangeland or something to get rid of in their rangeland. Also, some plants have developed their own biocontrol. So geraniums have developed semio chemicals um, to paralyze Japanese beetles. Uh, and again, if you give your plants everything that it needs to be able to produce these phytochemicals, it can do that and help, you know, protect itself if it has a strong immune system. So conservation biocontrol is the one that we want to focus on for our home gardens. How do we maintain these populations of things that we want in our backyard? Well, we've got to give them good food, water, shelter, um, and we do that by having a diversity of plants for nectaring for these um, invertebrate uh, biocontrol agents and also um, other types of things for the ones that we you know, want to have for, for birds eating bugs and things like that. Dragonflies eating all those mosquitoes. Here's some quick examples of how you could do that in your backyard. Love this picture of this um, natural rodenticide of the screech owl eating this little mouse, right? I much prefer that to things like mouse traps or poison bait traps. Um, in fact, I just put up some uh, mouse traps at the field station, and the mouse, the mice have eluded me to date. So too bad I can't have a, a pet screech owl there helping me out. Uh, and deliberate conservation biocontrol dates back 1,700 years or more. I mean, it was first documented by farmers hanging vines from in trees that had these weaver ants to trees that didn't have them because it helped facilitate dispersal and control these citrus pests. I mean, it's really quite ingenious, actually. So there's parasites or parasitoids. Uh, so we have flies and wasps that can um, parasitize insects that are problematic on our home gardens. And um, Mary Gardner goes into these these critters in quite in a lot of detail in her talk. So I recommend, again, going to listen to her talk about backyard biodiversity. It'll be really helpful if you want to learn more about these guys. 
guys. But real quickly, I just want to go through four crops that we would have um, in our backyards and, and things that we would want to attract. So if you see a tomato hornworm covered in these white cocoons, they, this has been um, attacked by an, uh, a wasp and the wasp has laid eggs in that tomato hornworm. And then those eggs have developed into larva eating the caterpillar from the inside out. And then those are the little cocoons. If you remove that individual from your garden, you've just removed like, I don't know, 50 new wasps that could continue to populate your garden and kill more of the tomato hornworms. So if you see things like this, you wanna leave those. That's biocontrol happening right in front of your eyes. And you're gonna be um, you know, facilitating their reproduction by leaving that alone. Same thing if you kind of see aphid mummies, maybe those aphid mummies are infected. If they look gross, you might be tempted to wipe them off. But if you leave them, then new things will hatch out of them and they will again help control the population in your garden. And so Pollinator Partnership is putting together these little cards about tomatoes, watermelons um, with their natural pests and natural enemies of the pests um, so that you will be able to hopefully find these soon enough on Pollinator Partnership's website to help think about how to bring these bugs in. It'll give some suggestions on good pollinator plants to plant for all of these um, natural enemies which we want to encourage. Um, squash bees are one of my very most favorite things. Um, and But we have a lot of problems with squash damage in our garden. And in fact, I was taking pictures of this beautiful red and black bug with clear wings on my milkweed this summer. And then I looked it up and figured out it was a um, squash vine borer adult. And I thought, well, shoot, it's gorgeous. And here it is nectaring on my milkweed plant, but it's also going to damage my squash vines. So I just made sure to, to look extra hard for damage on those vines. And when I would see it, I would bury those infected portions of the stem with soil and then uh, our, our plant would be off and running. Again, same with cucumbers. We've got lots of natural pests that we can think about bringing into our yard. I love this first picture here is a pirate bug sucking the juices out of a, um, a white fly larva. So uh, if you see that kind of stuff happening, that's good. You want that happening in your garden. They're giving you a hand and you're not going to need to use an insecticide on them to keep them down. So how come it doesn't always work? Well, you know, your plant may not be healthy enough to be able to, um, to handle a total infestation of a particular plant or bug. So anything you can do, again, to help it out by making it healthier through feeding the soil or wiping things off mechanically are going to give it a fighting chance to be able to allow that biocontrol agent to, to get a better handle on what's going on there. And it's certainly not a quick fix. I mean, you know, these ponds where we put the, the weevils took many years for weevil populations to build up to knock back the milfoil below that um, nuisance level. Uh, again, there's some great information out there about pollinator protection and pesticides and how we want to make sure we're, if we're going to use pesticides, we're applying them properly. And again, I would say that trying to find ways of not using any pesticides at all is the best thing that we can do for pollinators on our property, especially as they're in such steep decline. There's some great new um, science coming out talking about how integrated pest management by itself is just not enough we have to really think about integrated pest management and pollinator management within the same breath so how are we making sure that the things that we're doing are not only getting rid of our pests but doing good things for pollinators and biocontrol agents at the same time uh, okay just quickly i mentioned i will mention if you ever have the chance to watch this cane toad and unnatural history movie it is hilarious and talks about how, again, humans don't always plan for the best thing. So they introduce these cane toads to control sugarcane beetles, and it is definitely a biocontrol disaster. Uh, P2 Pollinator Partnership has some awesome publications on their website, so please go check them out. There's garden cards, there's lots of downloadable brochures, eco-regional guides, there's an Ohio specific guide series about planting pollinator habitat on your property or on your farm. Check that out. There's information about pesticide uh, use and pollinators. Check that out. Um, join us for pollinator week. There'll be lots of fun things going on. 
Um, and here's my contact information, which I will leave up. Please do, this is my cell phone number, but feel free, you can leave me a message or send me a text. Texting is actually the best way of getting in touch with me. Um, and send me an email if you want more information about any of this. And hopefully I have helped you understand how integrated pest management can be used on a garden scale at your own home to help um, uh, help pollinators. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much. That was, that was awesome. Um, just a reminder, anybody, if you have questions, you can go ahead and get those in the chat box now. Um, I also, I highly recommend you guys check out Pollinator Partnerships materials. They are, they're phenomenal. Uh, I've used them in my own garden. Uh, it's really good stuff. And I can include those links that you posted at the beginning for OSU's Tending Nature um, webinars. So, you know, I checked that out the first week. That was awesome as well. So I'll, uh, I'll include, yeah, I'll include that stuff in the follow-up email. Um, we do have a few questions. Is there a program for a local residential version of the bee friendly farming? Oh yes, uh huh. It's called bee friendly gardening. Mm -hmm. So if you go check out their handbook, there is a specific category for bee friendly gardens. And we we would love to. It's a relatively new program that Pollinator Partnership took over within the last year or two, and so they're trying to build it. And I would absolutely love, in fact, I need to do it for my own home garden. We, I would love Ohio to have a great showing. So Pollinator Partnership does a lot of stuff in regions. So I have, you know, um, uh, similar people to my position in, they're, they're in Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota. And how great would it be if Ohio showed up this year as like the center of bee-friendly farming gardens, especially Northeastern Ohio. I think we have such a great, thing going with urban agriculture and home native plant home gardens here, it would be great to have a good showing. That'd be awesome. Yeah, happy to help kind of navigate that or put you in touch with who you need to talk to, to, to work it out if you're having any issues once you check out the website. Awesome, thank you for offering that. Um, Kathleen wants to know, what do egg cases look like for the crazy worms? Oh, they look like, um, that's a great question, Kathleen. They are yellow and they, I should have put a picture. They are yellow, and I would say they're probably about the size, half the size of a grain of rice. So they kind of look like a yellow thing. So these guys do not overwinter as adults. In fact, the first place I saw them was when I was working as the natural resources manager at the Nature Center at Shaker Lakes. And I mean, I'm not afraid of much. Like I'm a, I'm a nature girl. I love being out in nature every, you know, I collected insects as a kid. I think that's how I kind of got into this field in general. And I picked up a shovel full of soil at the nature center um, behind their bird feeder area. And one of these, they move like a snake. It jumped out of the soil, like literally jumped. And I screamed my head off because I just had never seen anything like it. It is, they are otherworldly and they can decimate a garden and a yard. They will eat grass roots and kill off all your grass. And so uh, I have a friend at the University of Akron. She's an avid gardener, a master gardener, in fact. And somehow she brought in soil that was contaminated with these. And she had zero productivity in her garden this year. So it's just becoming more and more. And I don't think a lot of people know about them because it's such an odd thing. But it's it's a really, there was a great talk by, I want to say Chautauqua Land Trust about crazy worms this winter. It was really, really interesting. If, if you want to, watch it let me know send me an email and i'll find the link my friend becca who i went to graduate school with studied worms for her phd and so she was on the panel it's a really fascinating topic awesome uh, any suggestion on how to prevent or deal with japanese beetles oh yeah uh, there's <laughs> well so one this idea of the geraniums right so having some companion plantings is not such a bad idea if geraniums have a natural deterrent maybe planting some japanese or planting those geraniums around your crops that you're trying to prevent uh, might be beneficial i can't say for sure but i think it would be worth a try there's an old wives tale but well, i don't it's not super old but if you want to get rid of japanese beetles you get one of those japanese beetle traps and you put it in your neighbor's yard right so don't put those Japanese beetle traps in your yard because it brings all the Japanese beetles to your yard. But if you want to get rid of Japanese beetles, you want to lure them away from your yard, put it in your neighbor's yard. Um, yeah, they certainly are pesty. But 
you know, the again, the best that you can do for your plants is giving them the strongest, um, most robust immune system so that they can defend some of these things themselves. And if you can go out and pick stuff off, I mean, I know it sounds ridiculous, but, you know, thinking about uh, uh, being vigilant about what's happening in your garden before you have a thousand Japanese beetles, if you, the same as before you have a thousand stink bugs in your house in the winter, if you can get those one or two and they're not sending out chemicals to their friends and, and telling them to come join the party at your place, then you're reducing that number of, of uh, the pests that are coming to your yard initially, which is really, again, worth worth a lot in the in the long term goal. Yeah, so it sounds like a little bit of time upfront invested and in kind of, you know, selectively taking those off will pay out. Um, Carrie wants to know, are crazy worms different from jumping worms? No, they're the same. Yep, jumping worms are the same mm -hmm, as crazy worms. And would Pollinator Partnership have a chart for timing of pests and plantings? Oh, you know, that's a great idea. Hmm, I'm gonna put that on my list. We have a we have a bloom chart that's great for native plants, like so that you can have um, blooming plants from spring through fall, which is really important for bringing pollinators to your yard. You don't wanna have a big flush in the summer and nothing on either end. Um, you know, I had, um, and I, I love native plants. I have tons of native plants, but I don't only plant native plants. I plant uh, annuals too, because I love things like um, uh, zinnias. And so this year I had a whole patch of zinnias in with my tomato plants. And I like, there was end of October, I had a dozen monarchs on that zinnia patch nectaring on their way south to Mexico. So that was cool to see and really great that I had something there for them to be able to feed on that was still providing a good resource for them. Uh, but that's a great idea, I love it. And I'm totally gonna put, bring it up with my supervisor at Pollinator Partnership. And I think that, that would be a really great thing for us to make, so I am on it. If you wanna send me an email to remind me, feel free, but I think that sounds like a great idea. Awesome, um, I think we have time for one more here. Um, what are thrifts and what kind of, uh, what can we do to like, like kind of manage those? You know, that is a hilarious question because I had to look them up the other day. I'm like, what the heck is a thrift? It's like a weird, uh, it looks like, a, um, uh, I don't even know if I was looking at the larva or the adult uh, thrift, but it looks like one of the, the larva of a ladybug, almost like an alligator-y looking type organism. I think they're a sucking mouth part organism. A lot of our pests are sucking mouth parts. So like scale is like these very weird insects that suck juices out. I don't know exactly about thrips. It's a good question. I think that Mary Gardner talks about it in her talk, but they somehow, uh, you know, are damaging the plant. And I think I think the larvae are sucking mouth parts and so doing some damage that way. But that's a great question. I'm I'm not entirely sure. I had to look them up and they are very strange looking. Okay. Well, I just want to thank you so much uh, for taking the time to do this and for making yourself so available to us and the viewers. Um, if, if you had a question that wasn't answered, um, by all means, feel free to email me or uh, Laura and I'm sure I'm sure we can get that answered for you. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm happy to happy to help as best I can and send good resources your way. So don't hesitate to reach out. So it's been wonderful to talk with you all today. I hope that you learned a little something and that it was an enjoyable talk, even though it wasn't exactly what I had planned on talking about. I promise if you go check out those other couple of links, you'll get that information. And so this just added into the knowledge base, I hope. So I hope you no, have a wonderful that, Yeah, that was perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I'll be sure to include those links in the follow-up email with the uh, link to the video recording of this session and um, some information about our next one. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. I really appreciate it. Have a great day, everybody. I hope you're all safe and warm and uh, shoveled out. I'm still sore from <laughs> yesterday. My arms are still bothering me. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Take care, right. everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.